It's a gorgeous Saturday afternoon. I'm sitting in my favorite chair with a goofy grin on my face and a beer in my hand, watching the St. Louis Cardinals beat the perennial losers Chicago Cubs 6-0 in the ninth inning. My good friend Jim is sitting on the couch, but he's not in as good a mood as I am. The reason he's in such a bad mood is because of our story today. You could say it all started in college when I met Jenny, but it really started back in high school when I met Jim. I was a sophomore on the JV basketball team. I wasn't that good. I mostly stayed on the team because I liked playing and I liked the team spirit. Coach said he let me stay on the team because I showed the rest of the team that it was possible to enjoy the game, but part of me always believed that no one tried harder. Jim was a rookie that the coach had taken under his wing. Jim had good promise, and since I knew how to play the game, I just lacked the skill to do it well. He asked me to work with Jim one-on-one -on -one to get him up to the level of high school players. I was the youngest kid of two kids and Jim was the only kid, so I kind of became his big brother at school and kept the high school kids from picking on him too much. Gotta have a little fun, right? We soon became good friends off the court as well, and we were rarely seen apart. After spending some time at his home, I learned that his early life had not been easy. His dad left his mom when Jim was three years old. He didn't even bother to say goodbye. Jim's mom, Brenda, returned with Jim from the grocery store and discovered that all of his dad's clothes and belongings were gone, along with half of the furniture, the good half, of course. But they didn't have much anyway. When Jim was in high school, Brenda met a nice guy named Phil, and things got better for both of them. Brenda dated Phil for 18 months. They got along great, and then they got married. Jim had no problem sharing his mom with Phil. Phil just fell into their lives and even spent time with just Jim. It was Phil who encouraged Jim to try out for basketball and helped him pull up his grades so he could stay on the team. Phil was a class act. So Jim was getting his life together, and he even had a new daddy, making his family complete. It was easy for him to let his older brother fit into his new family life, and I think Brenda and Phil liked having Jim with me because they had some alone time. The brotherly relationship worked well because we looked alike. Both of us five foot four, brown hair, skinny and blue-eyed. It also worked well for me because now I had someone to look up to. Now that's a feeling that makes your day better. On the basketball court, it didn't take long for Jim to equal me because he had real talent. Coach Smith would tell us what he wanted Jim to work on, and we would do it because I had raw knowledge of the game, just from watching the pros play and listening to the commentators talk. That was my talent. The coach even named me his unpaid assistant my senior year. Together, we recruited Jim to star on the main team his junior year. We even made it to the Elite Eight in the state playoffs that year. Then it was time for me to graduate high school and start college, leaving Jim behind. It was only natural that I was studying to be a basketball coach. My freshman year, I tried to talk basketball coach Joe Fields into letting me help him with something. He brushed me off with the words, What can a stinking freshman offer? Of course, that didn't stop me from coming to games and watching his style and strategies. Pretty soon, I could guess what adjustments he would make, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of his players. If other teams managed to get their hands on my tapes, hell would be waiting for them. I went back to my old school for a couple games when my college team was away. The first couple games without me, Jim had a tough time. I talked to him at halftime and reminded him that Coach Smith always told me what to say and what to work on. He just needed to trust the coach like he trusted me and relax because he was playing too hard. The second half of the game went much better. The old Jim was back in the lineup. Another thing that happened during my freshman year was Jenny. I met Jenny at a party my roommate dragged me to, saying, All work and no play is what turns Ray into a nerd. In case you haven't guessed, my name is Ray. I was standing against the wall, sipping my first beer and looking around for someone vaguely familiar. Maybe someone I could talk basketball with. Suddenly, my chest and stomach were wet, and about 40 degrees colder than it had been a second ago. I lowered my eyes and saw a pretty brunette who was six feet tall with green eyes that were just eye-catching. Oh, shit! I'm so sorry! I tripped over something there and... I'm sorry. I was too stunned by those green eyes to utter a word out of anger, shock, or any other emotion. I wasn't a player in school, but I dated fairly regularly, and I had two or three steady girlfriends in my last two years of high school. I'm not usually at a loss for words when dealing with members of the weaker sex, but this time my brain shifted into neutral, and the engine roared to life. Out of habit, she started brushing the excess beer off my shirt while I watched her. 
trying to get another glimpse of the green fields of serenity I had seen just a moment ago. She had already had a few beers, so she wasn't using all of her brain, and just kept brushing my shirt until she noticed that a tent had formed on my jeans. Then she looked up at my blank face and asked, Are you okay? Why aren't you saying anything? Are you high or something? My brain decided to engage the clutch and jerked into second gear. I'm okay, wet and cold, but fine. I just got lost in your beautiful green eyes for a moment. I don't want to make it seem like a pickup line, but I've never seen such an exquisite shade of green before, and I just blacked out. Well, aren't you adorable? You're not exactly liver yourself, just a little tall. Did I mention she'd had a few drinks? Okay, maybe she'd had a little too much to drink, as her speech was a little slurred and she was wobbling slightly on her three-inch heels. I need another beer. Would you mind helping me buy another one? I'm having trouble making my way through the crowd to the keg. In a normal situation, I would have thought it would take big brass eyes to ask a man you just spilled beer on to reload his weapon to spread moisture. Normally that's what I would have told her, but those eyes found a warm corner in my soul. One of her shoes slipped on the wet floor and she fell on top of me. In a flash, my arms wrapped around her, gently but confidently supporting her. My decision was made for me. I realize I don't know you, but it seems to me that you may be close to your limit for the night. Why don't we go sit on the porch and talk it over? Then if you still want it, I'll bring it to you. Oh, and you're a gentleman too. A girl can get used to being treated like that. Come, let's go and talk. Once outside, where the music wasn't as loud, we introduced ourselves to each other and talked for a couple hours. We started to bond and made a date for the next night. We took it slow for the first few weeks, combining school and home basketball games. She was okay with my obsession at first, but I could tell it bothered her a little. When the season ended, we had more time to spend together, and things in Ray and Jennyville got good. We had been dating for a little over eight months, and things were getting serious between us. My last class on Friday afternoon was on the west side of campus, and it was a 30-minute walk or 15-minute bus ride to my dorm. I was pleasantly surprised to see Jenny's car, a classic red 1966 Mustang, parked along the street half a block from the building door. Her father spoiled her a little, but he had the money for it. I figured she wanted to get an early start on our date that evening and picked me up on that beautiful sunny May day. As we approached her, I absent-mindedly planned the rest of the day. First, I had to stop by the dorm to drop off my books and get ready to go out. Perhaps we'd have time for a kiss before heading to her house, assuming, of course, my roommate left town at noon to head home, like he almost always did on Fridays. I heard a familiar sound that brought me out of my reverie like a giant rubber band hitting the back of my palm. Jenny groaned. Looking closer at her car, I noticed one of her legs sticking out of the back window at an angle that was familiar to me. But after all, I was the one who was supposed to be there with her. My anger grew with each step as what I thought was happening was confirmed as we got closer. Surely it's not Jenny. Maybe she lent her car to someone else, I thought. The next moment, I was already standing outside the car and looking in the back seat watching some guy entertain my wife. Behind me, I heard a noise. It was the sprinkler turning on, watering the newly planted trees and shrubs a few feet away. Without even thinking, I grabbed the hose, rolled it up, and put the sprinkler away. Bringing the hose to the car, I put my thumb on the end of the hose to increase the pressure and got them both wet before they realized what was happening. When the jerk jumped out of the car, his pants had fallen down to his ankles. I took this opportunity to give him a top kick to the face as he looked down at his fallen clothes. He fell like a hundred-pound sack of potatoes. I know because I unloaded them at the grocery store where I worked until I graduated high school. Jenny yanked up her skirt and buttoned her blouse in a fit of anger as she got out of the car, but she couldn't pull herself together because I was still hosing her down. Who the hell do you think you are? Why did you do this? I demand. Midway through her tirade, I took my finger off the hose and let her cold, soaked, sorry ass see what was going on. I thought I was your boyfriend, but now I see I was wrong. I'm just another guy you've been had fun with. Dropping the hose to the ground, I looked into those waterlogged green eyes for what I hoped was the last time. At least I found out before I did something stupid, like proposing to you. You're just a nasty, cheap whore. I know I don't have expensive taste like you, but I know I deserve better than a cheating whore as a girlfriend. By this time, about ten people had gathered around to see what all the commotion was about, with more on the way. Ray, it's not what you think. I love you, Ray.
He's just... He was just the end of everything we had. I think you were cheating on me. If you weren't, just tell me. I've heard all these cliches that cheaters use when they get caught, like, it meant nothing to me. Well, it meant everything to me! If you love me the way you say you do, you sure have a stupid way of showing it. Let's take a vote, I address the gathered crowd. How many people here think that a couple living together for eight months should show their love for each other by having sex with someone else in the backseat of their car? Anyone? Just raise your hand. Jenny looked around at those watching us for the first time and was very embarrassed that her white shirt was soaking wet. Jenny, I calmed down a little. I've never cheated on you, never even thought about it. I won't tolerate it, not once. They say once a cheater, always a cheater. There's a reason they say things like that. They're called truisms because they're usually true. We're done. Don't call. Don't come back. Just stay away from me. You and your boyfriend deserve each other. Jenny, do me a favor. Do all good people a favor. Go to hell and stay there. I watched as she looked at the swaying figure of her illicit lover, fell to her knees and cried. I finished and walked towards the bus stop. While I waited for it, I decided that today was a good enough day for a walk, and I could really use some time to clear my head. Jenny never came to talk to me, and I was grateful for that. I still had something to say to her if she ventured my anger, and a few questions that were probably best not answered. I didn't have any bad feelings for that spoiled cheating bitch, that's what I told myself. Okay, I lied. My sophomore year started out better. My little brother got a basketball scholarship to the only college my folks could afford a good old state university 45 miles from home. I still went to games and had no doubts about the coach. Jim and I were discussing my observations after the game, and he thought it would be interesting to see what would happen if the team actually tried to apply some of them. It was during our fourth home game this year that I got Jim's attention just before halftime. The stupid ISU Redbirds were kicking our asses and then giving it right back to us. Coach Fields was trying different ways, but nothing was working. I told Jim to tell the coach that our edge hitter is left-handed and the other hitter is right-handed. Even though on paper they fit the forwards the way he put them, their forwards are left and right-handed too. Ask him to switch the forwards around so they play a lefty-lefty pairing instead of a lefty-lefty pairing. Needless to say, the coach was desperate and wanted to try anything that might work, so he did. The second half of that game was a great awakening for us. Nothing we did went wrong. We ended up winning by 15 points, trailing by 20 at halftime. After the game, Coach asked Jim why he hadn't told him about it sooner. Coach, it wasn't my idea. It was my buddy Ray. He loves basketball and is studying to be a coach. When can I meet him? We can always use a great mind like his on our side. That's how I got the basketball coach to take me under his wing. The rest of the time at school was relatively quiet. Jim and I looked out for each other to keep us out of trouble, but we still had a good time. We both dated, and in my senior year of high school, I met a wonderful girl, Katie, who treated many of life's important issues the same way I did, especially fidelity. But we took it slow, as we had both been through the crucible of failed relationships. Nevertheless, we got married a few months after I graduated and got a job on the varsity staff as a basketball coach. What can I say? Coach Fields liked my style and my ideas, which, I must say with all modesty, usually helped. Getting the job gave me another year to work with Jim, although we could no longer communicate as freely as we used to since we were now player and assistant coach. It seemed that Jim had a chance to enter the pro draft, so his senior year had to be the most important year for him. During the season, we spent as much time together as possible, working on improving his skills and discussing plays and strategies for the upcoming game. He was at the peak of his game that year, and our team had a good chance of making it to the big dance, which would give Jim national exposure. We were the underdog in the first round of the NCAA tournament, but Jim had a great day and we won by 12 points. True, we were eliminated in the second round, but it was our school's best finish in 15 years, so we were all very pleased with ourselves. Coach Field said he was proud to the bone of each of us and the part we all played in our success this season. We had a lot of fun at the school's victory celebration. Jim told himself that while there was a good chance he would be taken in the draft, because that's what the experts said, he would finish his degree in case it didn't work out. He decided he didn't want to play in the European League unless he was picked up by the pros. He loved his family too much to be so far away and for so long. 
The good news is that Jim was selected late in the third round by a Chicago Bulls team. That was great, because we expected him to go in the fourth or fifth round, and most likely to some team on the other side of the country. The Bulls' stadium was only five hours away. The bad news was that in the middle of his rookie year, a Pistons player had gotten a flagrant foul and hurt Jim's right knee. The Pistons player was ejected from the game. Unfortunately, Jim's career was over. Katie and I settled into life, me at State University, and her as a chemist overseeing the product testing lab at a corn and bean processing plant outside of town. We set aside extra money and saved to save even more. As a result of this frugality, just 18 months after graduation, we bought a starter home, a three-bedroom ranch house. We planned to start a family in five or six years, but for now, we just enjoyed being a couple, having our careers off to a good start, and having our new home furnished and decorated. We had been living in the new house for almost two months when we learned of Jim's knee injury. Katie had bonded with him. Of course she had, since I had spent so much time coaching him his senior year of high school. It was only natural to ask him to move in with us for a while, until he worked out a new plan for his life. Jim didn't want to hear about it, since his mom and Phil insisted he move in with them. But he wanted to stay in touch, so we visited him regularly for a while. Katie didn't mind as it gave her more time to spend with my folks when we came home for the day. After Jim rehabilitated from two surgeries, he could walk with almost no limp. Some people didn't even notice it unless they knew to look for it. He took a job as an insurance agent for one of the larger, more established companies in our hometown. His career as a local sports celebrity got him through many doors, but it was his caring nature and genuine charm that got him the sales. Life was good for all three of us. In the off-season, we mostly went home to visit family and Jim, or Jim came to our house for the weekend and slept in our spare bedroom. Last week, Katie asked Jim about his love life, since she has a friend at work who could use a good guy to get. Jim replied that he had been seeing the same girl for about a month now, and he had a good feeling about it. I was thinking it's about time you met her, so I'll see if she wants to come with me next weekend to stay, if that's okay with you. Jim, that's great. We have three bedrooms so she can have her own room, or if you're both up for it, you can share one. You decide. I smiled at him, winked, and nodded. We're looking forward to meeting the girl who lured my buddy. I laughed and punched him lightly on the shoulder jokingly. She hasn't lured me in yet. Let's just say she's already got the rope out and got the lasso ready. Jim grinned, returning the metaphor to me. He didn't bother to tell us anything more about her except that she was cute and special. It was six days ago, and I was doing my three-mile run on Saturday morning, expecting Jim and his mystery girlfriend to show up around noon for lunch as usual. So when I got home at 10, I figured I had time to shower and rest before they arrived. I was wrong. Damn how wrong I was. As I rounded the corner of my block coming home, I saw a red car in my driveway, but I didn't know whose car it was. As I got closer, I was overcome with a sinking feeling, and then all the anger and pain of freshman year came flooding back at me. I couldn't believe that he had somehow gotten involved with that stupid slut Jenny. The license plate confirmed my worst fears. My first impulse was to swing open the front door and yell, Get that cheating whore out of my house! As I gripped the handle of the storm door, I hesitated and changed my mind. How would this affect my relationship with Jim? I asked myself. No, as much as I wanted it to, as much as she deserved it, I couldn't do that to Jim. I took a deep breath and paused for a moment to think. I would contain my feelings and later I would tactfully warn Jim. He'll be more receptive to this method, and perhaps I can spare him some heartache. If he doesn't heed my warning, however, I'm sure she won't want to come back here any more than I wanted her to. Either way, that bitch was the last time she'd set foot in my house. Taking a deep breath, I reached for the doorknob again, hesitated, and took another deep breath before opening the door to my home and my acting career. There he is, yelled Jim to the girls in the other room as I walked in. Jim, you got here early. If I had known, I would have done the run earlier. Good to see you. We hugged as always with one arm. Katie and Jenny came in from the kitchen to complete the circle of introductions. I had an advantage because I knew who she was, and maybe she hadn't realized that Jim's friend Ray was her ex-boyfriend Ray. I was right. Jenny followed Katie into the family room and saw the cold look on my face. She let out a whoop and covered her mouth with her hand so no more sound would come out. For a moment it looked like she was about to pass out. Hi, Jenny, I said coolly. It's been a while. 
Oh, you two know each other? inquired Jim. Yeah, we met at a party freshman year of college. I turned away from Jenny, changing my facial expression to a friendlier one, and asked Jim, Do you think the Cardinals will take the division this year? I took him away from the girls, toward the TV that was showing a preview of the baseball game this afternoon. I thought it might be a little fun to torment Jenny if I could behave myself and not insult her outright. Katie looked at me, not believing that I could be so rude. Then she looked at Jenny, saw the look on her face, and decided there was more to the story. Katie tried to bring Jenny back into the kitchen, ostensibly to get us all a round of lemonade, but really to get to the bottom of it. Jenny decided to stay close to Jim for fear of what I might tell him. After a while, I remembered I needed to take a shower and excused myself. I had already flushed the water and was nearly naked when Katie walked into our bathroom with the inevitable question, What the hell was that? It's a long story that I never shared with you because I didn't want to reopen old wounds. It was because of her that I wanted to take my time in developing our relationship. I'd rather not go into details right now. I'll tell you all about it later. For now, just realize that this is the last time that cheap whore will be welcomed into this house. She looked at me in shock. I realized I may have raised my voice a little, but I hoped the noise of the shower would hide it. You can't say that. She seems like a nice person. What if she and Jim become friends and get married? Will you stop seeing Jim? I really hope it doesn't come to that. I guess Jim will have to come without her. I closed the door to the shower, hoping to bring closure to that topic as well. I knew better, since Katie was like most other wives, I said hopefully. The rest of the day passed in suspense. Even Jim sensed that something was wrong, but Jenny kept her eyes on him. I could wait. I took my time because I didn't feel like it. It was time for bed, and as I expected, they shared a double bed in the first guest room. As I turned out the light and got into our bed, I realized that the second phase of the Spanish Inquisition would begin at any moment, so I ducked the first round. For the next hour, I recounted in detail our meeting, date, and public breakup. I tried to be objective, but that's very hard to do when dealing with an emotionally charged issue like cheating on a slutty girlfriend. I even told her that I was thinking of proposing marriage to her in the near future when I caught them together that day. Her first question shocked me, as I hadn't even considered that possibility. Do you still have feelings for her? Just disgust and a little anger. I told her that day that I wouldn't tolerate cheating once, and that goes for you too. I'd be a complete hypocrite to even think about cheating, especially with someone like her. Hell, after what she put me through, I could never do that to someone I love. I'm throwing myself off a cliff first. If she hurts Jim, I might have to put her in her stinking Mustang and send her off a cliff. Okay, I believe you. Just calm down or they'll hear you. What are you going to say to Jim? You've got to tell him something. He's wondering what happened between you two. At first, I just wanted to tell her to get her cheap whore out of my house, but then I calmed down because I didn't want to offend Jim. I don't think I'll go into details unless he demands it, but I will tell him to be careful since she has cheated on him before and may do it again. I wonder what she's telling him because I'm sure he's been asking her questions too. Maybe she'll confess to him and you won't have to tell. I think you should consider putting up with her, for Jim's sake. I'm not saying you should be friendly to her, just don't be cold or insulting. Do you think you can do that for Jim's sake? I hope it doesn't work out between them, but I'll think about it because he's like a brother to me. Hell, he's closer to me than my real brother. Hell, I hope they break up soon. The rest of the weekend had been almost as stressful as Saturday, but now that I had an ally in the form of Katie, things were a little better. Maybe it was better because I'd let my feelings out in front of Katie last night, but don't think I'd even considered that possibility. I have a reputation to think about. They left shortly after lunch on Sunday. I'm sure Jim was feeling anxious too. I overlooked the fact that he didn't stay for the game that afternoon. That was just an example of what could happen if it came between us. When they left, Katie and I had a long talk, and she agreed that I should tell Jim, and we worked out a plan of what and how to tell him. She changed my mind a little about how I was going to do it, but decided that I was being honest to all concerned. She even made a couple of valid points about the various options. I decided to call Jim on Monday after dinner, but my workday was interrupted when Jenny walked into my office as I was going over the new crop recruitment reports. My door was open, so she walked in and when I didn't notice, spoke. Ray, I was wondering. 
I spun in place as if she had startled me, which she had. It was my turn for a shocked expression on my face when I saw her, but I recovered quicker and without any extraneous noise. I sighed loudly. I guess I should have expected this, but I figured it would be a phone call. Sit down, Jenny. She started to close the door before she sat down, and I said, No, leave the door open. The guys will think something funny is going on if you close it, especially if there's a woman here. I almost never close my office door, and none of the coaches here do. We have an open door policy, and the school makes us take it literally. I'd ask you what you want, but I think we both know what you want. I'm telling you straight out that I plan to warn Jim about you. However, I'm not going to go into all the unpleasant details, unless he gets them out of me himself. Since I don't want to relive that episode again, he's going to have to draw them out pretty hard. I wouldn't be a very good friend if I didn't warn him, but I hope you've changed your views. If things work out with you and Jim, and I can honestly tell you I hope they don't, you're going to have to be faithful to him. I mean, 110% faithful. Two more things you should know. I'll be watching you. I still have friends back home who would love to help Jim get rid of his cheating girlfriend. They'll be my eyes and ears. One last thing you need to know. If you hurt him as much as you hurt me, you better run fast and far. If I find you, there will be no coming back from hell this time. I didn't know if she remembered my last words or not, but I mentioned it anyway. Ray, I was going to say something before we started, but you've said it all so well. And that's fair, I think, considering what happened between us. But I still want to tell you this. I'm sorry. He was my old boyfriend from high school, and I skipped my last class and had a few beers with him. One thing led to another, and... Stop! You don't owe me any explanations, and I really don't want to hear any excuses. It happened over six years ago. I told Katie what happened, and she asked me if I had any feelings for you. I honestly answered that only anger and disgust, right now mostly disgust. Jenny's face reflected surprise at such a revelation. I guess she wanted to use any positive feelings I might have had to buy my silence. Or maybe I was just flattering myself. I also told her that I will tolerate you, but only as long as Jim is around. That means you are not welcome in my house or in my life as long as he is not with you. I won't try to ruin your relationship with Jim just because I don't want to make him angry. He's been like a little brother to me for over a decade, and in my family, family comes first. So I'm trying to be fair and not get back at you for what you did. I'm warning you right now, don't give me a reason to come after you. Ray, I'm so sorry. I can only imagine how much I hurt you, that you still feel so strong after all this. I want you to know that I didn't mean for this to happen. I thought you and I had something special. Now I feel that way about Jim. Don't worry, I've grown up a lot since then. After we broke up, I cried for a few days. Then I looked at what happened and realized that I had only myself to blame. I couldn't even bring myself to face you to apologize and try to explain everything. The last thing you said to me was go to hell and don't come back. I was in hell without you, and I only had myself to blame. I almost failed that semester. Okay, you've made your point, but I'm not changing my mind. I'm still not convinced that you won't cheat again, like I told you that day. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Can you honestly look me in the eye and tell me that was the only time in your life you cheated? She looked down at her shoes in shame. Damn! I was hoping I wouldn't get that answer. That was before I met you. She still wouldn't look me in the eye, and I realized it was a lie. It doesn't matter anymore. Treason is treason. How you could put the person you claim to care about through that emotional roller coaster, I'll never know. At first, I wondered what I did or didn't do that made you do that. Then I wondered if I wasn't manly enough for you, if I wasn't calling you in bed. I was angry at you and then at myself for what I couldn't do. I was torn wondering how long it had been going on and why. Was it a one-time thing, or did it happen the entire time we were together? It was months before I trusted another woman enough to go on a date again. But even then, I questioned whether I was enough for her. If you haven't been through this, you have no idea what it's like to be cheated on. That's why I'm not going to let you hurt Jim. And if you do... Ia, I get it. I want you to know that I grew emotionally and haven't cheated since. I had no idea I'd hurt you so much. She reached out to touch my hand, but I yanked it away. It's been long enough for me to forget about you. The love of a good woman my Katie has helped too. I've forgiven you, but I won't forget what you did. I can't. 
when I saw your car in my driveway, the vision of you being entertained in the back seat by that asshole was as vivid as the day I first saw her. Now I think we both know what's what, so goodbye. I turned away, picked up my reports and pretended to read them, waiting for her to leave my office. I heard her get up and I was about to think she was leaving when suddenly I felt her hand caressing my neck. If you remember, we were really good together. I could make you worth your money if you could see your way to... I turned around suddenly and an angry fire flashed in my eyes. I spoke slowly, barely containing my anger through clenched teeth. Get the hell out out of my office! Now! This time, she wasted no time in getting out of there. I couldn't believe she would do such a thing because I'm married, and she knows how I feel about cheating. I had to get up and walk down the hall a few times to cool down. How does she manage to bug me like that? I can't believe that one minute she's trying to convince me that she's changed and will be faithful to Jim, and the next, she's trying to bribe me with sex by actually cheating on him. With me! Of course, she didn't think that's what I needed. I'd made that clear to her from the start. Now I was even more grateful that she had left, and Katie had come. That evening I got home just as Katie was pulling up to the house ahead of me. I got out of the car and called out to her as she headed into the house from the garage. Baby, you won't believe what happened to me today. She walked quickly into the house and I, figuring she was in a hurry to use the restroom, nonchalantly entered my house. I thought I would have to wait to talk to my wife about my crazy day until she was done, but she was waiting right outside the door to ambush me. I thought we agreed that you were going to be nice to Jenny for Jim's sake. She called me this afternoon crying that you kicked her out of your office and told her to go to hell. Just tell me, Ray, what did she do to deserve that? Why did you do it, Ray? She was totally hysterical. Whoa, slow down. What did she say to you? She said she came to apologize and try to be nice to you for Jim's sake. She said she just wanted us all to get along. She said you told her to go to hell and unceremoniously threw her out of your office. Did you? She's partly right. Jim, I can't believe you're going to do this. I thought we agreed on a plan. Now you're going to do it. Wait a minute. I think you would do exactly the same thing. Let me tell you the whole story. It took some time, but I reproduced it as best I could. You expect me to believe that, Ray? She hit on you and you lost your temper and threw her out. Come on! That's the way it was, as I recall. I laid it out for her, just as we discussed. I tried to be polite, didn't yell at her, until the very end. I couldn't believe that one minute she was telling me about how she'd changed, and the next minute she was stroking my neck, offering sex to keep me quiet. It made me appreciate how much better I am with you. That's not entirely true, Ray. She told me she came to you to apologize. Then you told her you were going to tell Jim all about her and even lie a little. In his eyes, she would be toast and you laughed about it. I know you can be vindictive sometimes. She said she really likes Jim and she can't let you do that. She said she was sorry she hurt you, but she was young, stupid, and a little drunk. Then she said she would do anything to make it right. She said she would tell Jim that the two of you had a history and that there was one if you didn't lie or exaggerate it. Then you told her to either take it in the ass or get out of my office. And she left. Okay, I realize that if you were worried about Jenny and me, the jealousy you might feel would make it believable. Not to mention the almost automatic sympathy for the other crying woman. One thing I ask you to keep in mind, our open door policy at work. My office door must remain open except for certain confidential events. If my door closes, an email notification is sent to Coach Fields. So what? You think I yelled loudly at her and demanded sex with the door open? Do you think I'm that stupid? Oh, I'm so sorry, Ray. I forgot about that. I shouldn't have doubted you. Can you forgive me? Of course I can. I know how persuasive and conniving she can be. She played on your emotions and swayed you to her side before you even began to doubt her. She's bad news, even worse than I thought. Now she's trying to come between us. I'm starting to worry that she's going to come between Jim and me. I can't wait to call Jim tonight. Just then the phone rang. We looked at each other, and I got a bad feeling. Just as I'd feared, it was Jim. Ray, I need to talk to you, began Jim as soon as I spit out my greeting. Actually, a bunch of bloody words. What the hell is going on in your head? I just left Jenny at her house and she was sobbing like hell nonstop. It was so bad I couldn't make out half a dozen words. 
Ray kept coming out, and then she'd break down even harder. Finally, she whispered, Ray hit on me. After that, she went crazy and locked herself in her room. I think she ended up crying and I went outside to find out what you did to her. Ray, if you molested her, I'll tear you into so many pieces they won't even find your fingerprints. What the hell did you do? Jim, I said as calmly as I could. Take a breath, brother. We can discuss this, and I'll be happy to tell you everything that happened from the beginning, or if you like in brief, what happened today. Let's start with what happened today. I heard Jim take a couple breaths and start to calm down. Hey, if I were you, I'd be upset too. As crazy as it sounds, here's what happened today. As you may have noticed, when you brought her in on Saturday, Jenny and I knew each other. Without going into too much detail, Jenny and I dated for about eight months during my freshman year of college. When she saw me and realized we were buddies, she was worried that I might tell you about her. As you noticed, she didn't leave your side all weekend, but I didn't say a word. Shortly after lunch today, she came into my office. Before she could ask me not to tell you anything and what I was about to tell you, I explained to her that you were family to me and I had to warn you about her. I told her that I hoped she had changed, but I was afraid that she hadn't or that she might revert to her old habits in the future. I had planned to tell you without detail that after we dated for eight months, she cheated on me. I told her I'd get on with her, for your sake, but if you weren't around, she shouldn't be either. We discussed the incidents and she tried to explain it to me, but I told her it was six years ago and it was long over. She tried to apologize to me for that incident and told me it was a one-time thing. I told her that I had forgiven her a long time ago, but that I could never forget or trust her again. I then told her that now we both knew where we stood and it was time for her to leave. When I got home, Katie was already worked up and yelling at me because Jenny had called her crying and said I had yelled and molested her in my office. Think about that for a minute. In my office, which has a strictly enforced open door policy. You've been there and you know what I mean. If I molested her there, I'd be out on my ass by now. I was just calming Katie down when you called. I was planning on calling you tonight to talk about it, but not like this. Jim, I'm sorry. I didn't want to tell you about all this, but I couldn't not say something. The family sticks together. We look out for each other. She may have changed like she told me, but I can't know if she's really changed. I don't know what's going on in her head. All I know is that I can't forgive myself if she puts you through what she did to me, and I didn't warn you about it. I'm really sorry you got caught in the middle of all that shit. There was silence on the other end of the phone, but I could hear him breathing. He was absorbing everything I told him, and he didn't like it. He had to accept what I said, not what the love of his life told him. He had a big crush on her. Otherwise, he would have used the logical side of his brain and realized that I was telling the truth or at least that I had enough brains to not propose to someone in his office. I was hoping that he would realize that I was probably right, or at least give me credit, and we would talk some more when he calmed down. However, I expected him to believe me enough to blow up at me for a while, because he'd be angry that anyone had lied to him. And then we would talk. The third possibility that was swirling around in my head was that he would believe her, and she would succeed in ruining our friendship. Ray, you lying son of a bitch! You're only lying about her to get even for her dumping you. It's time for you to grow up, man. Like you said, it was six years ago. I treated you like a brother, and you do this to me. I finally found happiness with her, but your jealousy and thirst for revenge are trying to ruin it for me. I can't believe you're putting your shit before my happiness. Goodbye, Ray. Go to hell and stay there! I regretfully put the disconnected phone back in the cradle, thinking, option number three really sucks. I may have just lost my best friend. How did it go, sweetie? Katie inquired. About as bad as it could be, I replied sadly. I noticed you didn't tell him she proposed to you. Yeah, in his condition, there's no way he would have believed me. If I hadn't been there, he wouldn't have believed me either. Besides, I thought it would be too much to tell him at once. I guess you're right. She hugged me. I just hope he thinks about it and comes to his senses when some time has passed. I'm sure he'll come to his senses sooner or later. You two have been close for so long, he'll miss you and come back soon. You'll see. I hope you're right. The next day I made good on my threat to ask her to keep an eye on me. I dug up an old picture of Jenny that I'd buried in a box of old university junk. I don't know why I'd kept it, 
but now I was glad I'd done it. I scanned it and emailed it to a few buddies who I knew were single and frequented the bars back home. I called them, explained what was going on, and asked them to keep an eye on her. I also told them that Jim and I had a fight about it. One guy asked me if this was my way of getting even with her for coming between us. I told him I didn't care about her. Don't do it for me, do it for Jim. If you were in Jim's shoes, wouldn't you want your friends to look out for her for you? I told them all not to talk to Jim about it because he's really mad at me, and he might get mad at them too. I didn't want him to be mad at anyone who cared for him. Right now he was blinded by love and not listening to reason. We have all been in that situation at least once. I told them not to follow her or stalk her or anything like that. I just wanted them to keep an eye on where they were spending their time, and if they saw her doing something she shouldn't, to report it, preferably to Jim. If they were too cowardly to do that, have them send the pictures to my phone, and I'd take it from there. One of the old gang, Steve, surprised me by asking if he wanted to give her a fidelity test. Being a Casanova, he figured he'd already hit on her a few times, and if she could resist him, all would be well. I told him to back off. If Jim suspected we were trying to set her up, he'd be furious with all of us. I told him loud and clear, no, don't try to hit on her. Did I get that right? They all agreed to help, some more reluctantly than others, but I had nearly a dozen spies in my network. I could only hope it had all been for nothing. Two months passed, and I missed Jim very much. I sent him several letters trying to apologize and see if we could break up. I told him that I felt like I was in hell without him. He simply replied, stay there. Rich, one of my spies, sent me a picture of Jenny dancing in a bar with another guy. He was medium height with sandy hair. I called him as soon as I got the picture. Rich, this is Ray. How's it going? That's great, Ray. I think the picture is of your girlfriend dancing with some scumbag. I took a picture of her last night. I thought I'd better send it to you first in case it's not her. It's Jenny. Damn, I was hoping she'd drop her cheating ways. What happened after they danced? I didn't see her go in, so I don't know how long she was there or if she came alone. They kissed a little, but nothing that I don't do with my cousins, you know what I mean? She left about 15 minutes later, alone. He stayed and danced for another hour or so. It all looked pretty innocent to me. You're probably right, Rich. I'm not going to do anything about it since it looks innocent, but let me know if she does anything else, okay? Sure, Ray, no problem. Playing private investigator is a lot of fun. Maybe next time I'll follow her to the parking lot since I know it's her. Rich, don't get too close. We're not stalking her or anything unless she looks like she's doing something she shouldn't be doing. But even then, keep your distance. If I'm wrong, I don't want Jim to get mad at you. We're just trying to keep an eye on him. Ray, I'm glad you're one of my buddies. We could all use a friend like you watching our backs. Hey, that's what friends do, right? Thanks for the news. Talk to you later. I tried calling Jim's cell phone many times, but when he saw it was me, he would send it to voicemail. I felt like I had cheated on him and I wanted him to forgive me. I hoped she wouldn't do anything bad to Jim. About six weeks later, Quince, another of my acquaintances, called me and sent me a picture of Jenny coming out of a bar with a tall guy, but only five or six inches taller than her, too short to be Jim. They were laughing and I could only make out half of his face. Quince said he followed them in the parking lot, but they got into different cars when they left. He informed me that they kissed for a minute or two before she got into her car, but he couldn't get a picture of them in the dark. She was getting bolder and bolder. Two weeks later in another bar, Paul sent me pictures of Jenny and a stocky, muscular guy a couple inches taller than her. In the first picture, they were dirty dancing. In the second, they were exchanging tongues at their table. Paul said they sat in her car for about 10 minutes, but both of them always had their heads up and were sitting in the front seat. They kissed some more, but again, it was too dark for his camera. It didn't look good. On Thursday evening, Rich and another spy, Oscar, were at the Come On Inn enjoying refreshments and listening to the orchestra when Jenny and Jim walked through the door. Looks like the lovebirds are still together, Oscar remarked, nudging Rich to look at the couple coming through the door. Guess she won't be going after a stranger today. Things could get very interesting. Isn't that the guy Paul caught her with a while back in that stall over there? Gosh, you've got a good eye. I think I do. Let's get our cameras ready in case something happens. I know we won't have to show the pictures to Jim, but if everything goes well, Ray will want to see them. 
Jim and Jenny took a table off to the side where they could have some privacy, and her mystery boyfriend, I later learned his name was Nate, couldn't see them. Soon they had a drink and got up to dance when a good song came on. It took Nate two dances to notice her on the floor with Jim, and you could tell he didn't like it one bit. He had a nasty look on his face as he got up and quickly walked over to Jenny. He touched Jim's shoulder slowly and gingerly, catching him off guard with a determined, You don't mind if I step in. I didn't think so. With those words, he squeezed between them and led the startled Jenny away from Jim and into the crowd of dancers. After the initial shock passed, Jim twisted his neck and used his height to spot them, just as Nate was leading Jenny down the hallway to the bathrooms. Like a shot, he followed them, and just getting to the short hallway where the bathrooms were, he saw the back door close. Jim jumped outside like a ball of fire, only to discover that they didn't go outside, and it was a fire door, and once outside, you can't go back in. By the time Jim reached the entrance and convinced the bouncer that he had mistakenly gone out the back door, almost five minutes had passed. Looking around the dance floor, Jim found that they were nowhere to be found. Since they were last seen heading toward the restrooms, Jim figured he might have dragged her into one of them after opening the back door to get him outside. Jim squeezed through the crowded dance floor and finally found himself back in the auditorium. He was in such a hurry that he didn't notice the back door close again. He heard someone screaming in the men's room, and as he swung the door open, he found Nate on the floor, holding his crotch with his right hand and his bloody face with his left. Jenny was standing against the far wall with both hands pressed to her face, looking terrified. Jim's angry face smoothed out as he walked over to Jenny and put his arms around her. It seemed to him that Nate had tried to hurt or rape Jenny, and she had knocked the jewelry away from him and punched him in the face. It's all right, Jenny, Jim said soothingly. He won't hurt you now, especially with me here. I didn't know you knew how to defend yourself. You really beat him up pretty badly. But he deserved it! Let's go outside and I'll have them call the police. No! Jenny shouted, then realized she was protesting too much. Calming down, she added, I mean, you're right, it's fine now. Why ruin our evening? He'll lick his wounds and I'm sure he won't try it again. Just leave him alone, Jim. Nate's moans and wriggles were subsiding. Jenny was afraid his ability to coherently articulate his thoughts would return any second. So she took a deep breath to calm herself and said to Jim, I think I'm ready to go home. I've had enough excitement for one night. Are you sure you don't want me to call the police? What if he tries to do it again, to you or even someone else? You don't want that on your conscience, do you? I'm sure he won't try that again, she said, looking at his curled up body in the fetal position, swaying slightly near the urinals. At least not with me, she added to herself. The next day, Oscar and Rich called me, the three of them, and recounted the events of the evening. So she left with Jim, letting Jim believe that she put Nate down? I asked incredulously. Yeah. I had to leave quickly out the back door to administer first aid to my arm. I thought I was going to have to get stitches, but a couple butterfly strips cured me. That dude's face is as tough as it is ugly. Oscar, thank you for going along with this. I really didn't expect any violence. No problem, Ray. When we saw him drag her into the Jones, we followed to make sure Jim had backup. He fell for the ruse with the back door open, but we saw the man's door closing as well. Rich followed Jim outside and I went inside. I just pretended I was really drunk and wanted to take a leak, so they ignored me. When he started roughing her up, I don't like it when someone molests a woman no matter how slutty she is. I kicked him in the balls from the back, turned him around and punched him in the face. Then I broke free. I bet he wished I was wearing steel-toed boots. By then, Ray, I was already behind Jim and stayed outside the john, listening in case he needed backup. Rich added. I went in there after they came out. It was Nate Birkins. You remember him, don't you? He lived on my street, but he went to school two years ahead of us. He got kicked off the soccer team and the track team for losing his temper. He was pretty damn bad. Oscar messed him up, but good. I asked him if he needed help, and he just wheezed at me. Then I said, okay and walked away. I never liked him. He's just a damn bully. Oscar stepped into the conversation. Are you going to tell Jim what really happened? I don't think so. We don't have enough evidence yet. It's just rumors and overheard phrases. If you were Jim, would you consider that enough? No, I guess not.
Still, Rich added, if it were me, I'd want to be warned so I could keep an eye on her myself. Or that I wouldn't do anything like give her expensive gifts or money. She's got his head so far up her ass he hasn't seen daylight in a month, Oscar chimed in. He'll find a way not to believe it. I know, I've been there myself. What's there? We've all been there, and you know it. We'd kill the messenger and call it a day. If you don't have a smoking gun, he'll only get mad. I suppose you're right. Thanks a million, guys. Next time I'm in town, I owe you a couple beers. That's for sure, Rich agreed. Make me a whiskey, added Oscar. You got it. Later, guys. Later that night, I told Katie what the guys had told me. I just don't understand what's going on in her head. If she can't be satisfied with one guy, why doesn't she find someone who can build an open relationship? I know for a fact that Jim and I won't share, and she should know that too. The no-sharing rule works both ways, Buster, reminded Katie. I better not find out you were peeping on me or else. She playfully pointed her finger at me, making it look like a gun, and shot me. Hey! I'm not a hypocrite. I'm strictly a one-woman man. I understand how she got between me and Jim. I don't understand why she thought she could get between you and me, or why she wants to try. What's going on here that I don't understand? I'm sure there's nothing there. She probably decided that the best offense is a good offense. She wanted you not to tell Jim, so she figured she'd keep you busy and preoccupied with me. I don't like being used like that. I guess you're right. Damn, she's really starting to get on my nerves. I can't wait for this to be over. The next afternoon, I was in my office when my cell phone rang. The caller ID confirmed that it was another one of my spies, Nick Wilson, who works as a construction foreman. Maybe he had some more information about Jenny, or maybe he was just calling to chat. There's only one way to find out. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Hey, Ray, does that girl you asked me to keep an eye on drive a 60-something red Mustang? I thought you said she did, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, that's her. It says Gen Gen 1 on the license plate. It's a classic her father gave her when she turned 18, but she doesn't appreciate it. I think I have a clue for you. For the past few weeks, one of our Mexican workers has been bragging about how he's been entertaining some white chick on his lunch break and sending her home to her boyfriend for sloppy seconds. Today, as she was dropping him off, I caught a glimpse of her car, and guess what? It was a mid-60s red Mustang. He brags about meeting her on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and they park in the nearest alley to have fun in her back seat. She even brings him lunch. I'll be ready for them when they arrive on Wednesday and take some pics. He may just be pouting his lips, but I'll find out for sure. Just be careful, Nick. If it's not Jenny, you could get yourself in trouble. We don't want to cause trouble for you or anyone else. We just need to confirm that she's cheating and let Jim know. He'll decide what to do. I can take care of myself. Most of the Mexicans here are afraid of us in the department, and the rest of them treat us with a lot of respect. I guess they don't want to piss us off and have immigration come to check up on us, he grinned. I'll be fine. It was almost three o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon when I got a call from Nick asking if I had checked my email recently. I opened it and found nine pictures of Jenny and a Mexican guy doing it in the back seat of her car. He also attached a video file and told me that he had gotten in, shot the video, and got out unnoticed. He even managed to get the Wendy's package off the front console. All I could say was a sad disbelief. Shit! On Friday at 11.30, I had an appointment with Jim at his office, under an assumed name, since I knew he didn't want to meet me. After the receptionist told me to go to the third door on the right, I stood up like a hamstring to make it to the door before he could get down the hall and stop me. I needn't have worried. He was sitting at his desk finishing some notes when I came in and closed the door. He looked at me and started to get angry, but I stopped him. Before you kick me out, for the sake of all the wonderful times we've had together, do me a small favor and watch this. I put a small DVD player on his desk that already had a video recorded on it of a cameraman calmly walking up to the back of a red Mustang, showing Genjin one on the license plates for a second and then approaching the car from the side. As the camera got closer to the car, you could hear the groans and creaking of the springs as the car bounced. I can't describe the feeling of deja vu I got the first time I watched it, and it goes without saying that I didn't want to listen to it again like Jim did. Jim's face turned white and maybe a little green around the edges. 
I was ready to give him the trash can. He had the same reaction I had when I watched this. Good thing he hadn't had lunch yet. I turned off the player. He'd seen enough. When he was done, I gave him a paper towel I'd gotten from the bathroom to wipe his face. Jim, I'm really sorry to have to show you this. If you're still mad at me, I'll understand and leave without any problems. I had to show you this because you need to know about it. I didn't film it. A friend of ours did. He and the two of us are the only ones who know about it. This is the only copy because he taped it, and I deleted it from my computer after I made this copy. He took an oath of secrecy. They've been seeing each other for three or four weeks now, as far as we know, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Gee, Jim said, spitting into the trash can. We have lunch meetings with my boss these days. She knew I'd be busy. There's one more thing. If they're true to form, there's a meeting in about 15 minutes, and I know where, if you're interested. Let's go. Okay, but let me drive. You probably shouldn't be driving right now. We drove in silence for a while. I could feel Jim digesting my news. Suddenly, Jim spoke up. Ray, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have believed her over you. She said you broke up with her when you caught her with another guy on a walk. She said you went into a rage and started yelling and made a public scene. She thought you wanted to get back with her and start something on the side and was going to tell Katie about it. But I talked her out of it. I should have known you wouldn't do that, bro. It's just not like you. I'm sorry, man. Don't worry about it. We're brothers. I'm just sorry she came between us, and I missed you the whole time we were apart. When you called me that day, she had already called Katie with her pack of lies. When I got home, Katie jumped on me and scolded me for hitting on Jenny and bringing her to tears. What did she do? I'm going to destroy that sneaky bitch. Take it easy, Jim. We don't need you going to jail for someone like her. I'm not saying payback isn't necessary, but think before you do it. The best revenge won't be worth a shit if she can visit your sorry ass in jail and laugh at you all the time. Yes, you're right. I'll try to stay calm. By the way, it was Oscar who massacred Nate Birkins in the bathroom that night, not Jenny. I guess she didn't tell you the whole story about what happened. Are you lying to me? What else did she do? I filled the rest of the disc with this story. We drove slowly past the alley, and about three houses away was a red Mustang parked on the right side of the alley. There was a large truck parked on the other side of the alley, so we couldn't drive through the alley even if we wanted to. We parked on the street just outside the alley and walked onto the all-too-familiar sight of a bouncing red car. Jim stood next to them, and I saw his face smooth out when he saw them. He paused as it all became too real, and was about to open the car door when I stopped him. I pressed my finger to my lips to remind him to be quiet and whispered, I have an idea. While the oblivious couple grunted and groaned for good measure, I led Jim over to a truck parked on the other side of the alley and began connecting a hose to the tank. It was a water truck, the kind that people with backyard pools call when they need to fill them up. I recognized it from the sign on the side. Jim picked up on my plan and connected another six-inch diameter section of hose to the one I had just attached to the truck. He carefully placed his end on the front seat through the open window and waved me over. I opened the valve to full capacity. Within seconds, the insides of the truck filled with water, and it rushed through the open windows. We stood back and watched the fun. Jim and I laughed as several people raised their heads, spitting and coughing. We laughed even harder as various articles of clothing began to wash through the newly formed waterfall into the street. We heard laughter behind us and saw Nick standing there laughing so hard he was having trouble breathing. When Jenny stuck her head out the window, I shut off the water. She reached for the handle of the outside door and opened it. When the big wave hit the alley, she climbed out, not realizing she was topless, and ran angrily toward the three of us. You sons of bitches! Ray, I should have known you were behind this! If you wanted to get in my pants, you didn't have to... I cut her short. I never want to go near you and your dirty, cheating pants again. I thought I made that clear years ago and again in my office last month. Remember, if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're doomed to repeat them. Last time you got wet, this time you will get wet. By the way, I don't know what makes you think you're trying to ruin my marriage and my friendship, but you better cover yourself or you'll be arrested. I think your bra is headed for the sewer drain over there. She looked down at herself and was convinced I was right. Blushing three tones, she looked over and saw that her underwear, including her red panties, were quickly flowing downstream. 
This caused another round of laughter from the three of us as she quickly ran after them, her wet, heavy skirt slipping downstream. She nearly fell over when the skirt came down to her knees, and in her pursuit of the garment, she picked it back up. Manny had managed to gather enough clothes to look properly dressed, but he was still soaked to the skin. He headed toward us, shouting angrily in Spanish, probably scolding us. Then he saw Nick and suddenly wondered how he was going to beat us up. Nick spoke up. Manny, I'll give you a ride to work. I'm parked at the end of the alley. Get in the back of the truck. You're too wet to sit in the cab. Sorry about your lunch. Well, actually, no. You were entertaining my buddy's girlfriend. Manny headed toward the truck, muttering to himself. Jim asks, Nick, what made you show up? I'm sorry to tell you that I'm the cameraman of that video you saw. Ray told me he was coming today, and I guessed you two would be here, so I came to help. You guys already have it under control, so I'm going to go. What made you flood the car? That's ridiculous. I thought I was going to burst out laughing. The look on her face was priceless. The best part is I got it all on video. He held out his camera phone. It was Ray's idea. I was just about to pull him out and beat the crap out of him when Ray stopped me and... Well, you saw the rest. It would have been even funnier if... Yeah, I feel your pain, man. Been there, done that, and got that t-shirt. If you need anything, be sure to give me a call. Nick put one arm around him and walked down the alley. He turned around. Don't be a stranger, Jim. Thanks. Now I know who my real friends are, including you, Ray, he said, turning to me. We hugged again, adding a friendly pat on the back. When we were done, we noticed Jenny walking back down the alley toward us. Nick, who was walking towards her, stopped, picked up a piece of pink fabric, and threw it at the nearest tree. Snagging on a branch, he turned around and revealed that it was Jenny's shirt. We giggled as we saw the enraged look on her face. Nick laughed loudly as he walked away. Jenny was as mad as a wet hen, and even wetter than her. She was dripping and splashing with every step, her lacy underwear tangled in her hand. If it's possible, I think she was even more furious now than when she first approached us. Just then I heard the driver of the water truck asking loudly and angrily what had happened to his water. I went to deal with it, and Jim and Jenny started bickering. I explained to the driver what was going on and offered to pay him for the entire load. He refused my offer, saying, I just wish I could see that cheating whore get her reward. I walked back to the car as Jenny was already starting it up and getting ready to drive away. Jim gave her one last admonition. Jenny, I never want to see your cheating whore ass again. If you need anything from my apartment, you can send your friend for it. One last thing, Jenny, you can take your lying, cheating, cheap, backstabbing ass and go to hell. I joined Jim, adding in unison, and stay there. After note, somehow a DVD of her sex scene with Manny in the back seat started popping up around town. It had been sent out anonymously, but I wasn't lying to Jim when I told him I deleted it from my hard drive. It turns out that my dear wife knew how to recover a lost file from a computer hard drive, okay, maybe I showed her how to do it, and had recorded several copies, about 30 at last count. She sent them out to Jenny's friends and her wealthy elitist family. Seeing their precious daughter get into a fight with a lowly Mexican laborer was not very pleasant. Attached to the letter was a label. In case you're wondering why Jenny will never marry a classy guy like Jim. Jenny left town less than two weeks later. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.